Our next uh, session here is on action, robotics, motor control, navigation. Before we get started, uh, Daniel and I were just talking, and I had meant to do this earlier today anyway. Uh, give me a show of hands if you think of yourself as primarily being a neuroscientist or interested in neuroscience. Um, and let's see a show of hands if you think of yourself as primarily doing machine learning and AI. You can raise your hand twice if you want to. Okay, so that's underrepresented at the moment. Um, how many of you are affiliated with NYU? How many of you are affiliated with uh, another academic institution in New York? Okay, how many of you are from industry? Thin. How, how many of you are from, yeah, C Greg Corrado in the back. Well, you count worth a lot, so that, you know, so that, we, that balances out. Um, how many of you traveled here from outside the New York area? Oh, wow. Okay. That's a surprise. Okay, great. Um, so first up, um, we're going to hear some robotics from Leslie Cabling, who's at uh, MIT, uh, and she will talk about Come on down. Um, making robots behave. All right. So I am going to be an yet another kind of outlier, or maybe a new vertex in this polytope. So I work on robots. I view my job as making robots solve hard problems any way I can. Right. So I am motivated by the problem of getting a robot to do something in a complicated and messy environment like this kitchen. And I want to take a tiny issue with the first speaker who said, oh, well, at least for the purposes of my talk, uh, I'm going to equate AI with modern, modern neural networks. So I think modern neural networks are important, and they afford us a bunch of really useful tools for doing some parts of our job. But at least from my perspective, I don't think that's the whole story. And so what I'm going to do is talk about the way I have been approaching the problem of doing this and try to weave in a theme of what role learning has to play as we do this problem. So the way I view the job that I have is to make a robot. So a robot is a system that interacts with the world. It takes actions. That changes the state of its environment. It makes observations. And my problem is to figure out what program to put in the head of the robot. So for me, a program that goes in the head of the robot, it could be anything, but it's something that takes a history of actions and observations and gives out the next action. Like fundamentally, that's what it has to do. I don't think that you could really argue in some sense with that if you take the computational view. So that's my problem. And the question then is, well, what program should I put in the head of my robot? And the answer is, well, I should have an understanding in some sense of my robot's niche, of an expectation over the kinds of environments it's going to find itself in. And my job as an engineer is to find the program that goes in the robot's head that maximizes its sort of suitability for the expected environments it's going to find itself in. That's how I, I think about my problem. And if I state it this way, you might say, rrr, rrr, it doesn't sound like she does learning. But of course, learning plays an important role, actually, in two ways in this setup. So uh, the first way that it plays a, plays a role is like the way that people thought about reinforcement learning in the robotics context early on. I like to call it learning in the wild, right? So I take my robot, my robot. I deliver it to you, you take it out of its crate, it knows some stuff but not everything and it has to learn the rest. It has to learn maybe exactly how to calibrate itself, maybe how to work in your kitchen, how to do specific things. So that's learning in the wild, it has to adapt to the particulars of the environment it finds itself in. But there's also learning which is in some sense what most of the learning is that, or much of the learning that people talk about in computer science applications of machine learning, and that's what I like to call learning in the factory. Right? That's learning that I, the engineer, do because I don't know what prior abilities to build into the robot. So my favorite example is face detection. Right? My robot might need to detect faces. It would be unreasonable for a robot that I deliver to you to have to learn on the job 
how to detect faces, right? That would take a lot of training examples in a really long time, and it would be a really useless robot. So I would like to build that into my robot, but of course I don't know how to write the program that will detect faces effectively. So what I'm gonna do is in the factory, use machine learning to figure out some of the prior information that needs to go in the robot so that when I put it in the world, it can learn efficiently. So I'm really interested in learning in these two fairly different roles. Okay, so what can I do? Let's think about the in the factory part. So the job that I need to do. So one way I know how to do my job, I know how to do it pretty well, is I can write a bunch of code. And if you see me lurking in the back, I might even be doing that. Another way to do this job would be to get some big generic bunch of neural network goo and put it in there and train it a lot. Now, I'm pretty sure that neither one of these strategies is all by itself the right strategy, right? The, uh, the, the pure coding requires me, the engineer, to know everything about the system I need to build. The pure learning does not allow me to build in the stuff that I do know and to take advantage of that and to reduce the learning requirements. So I'm really interested in trying to understand some basis set of computational mechanisms that I can build into my system and then uh, for right now, actually let me talk about the basis set for a minute. So what, what, what kind of basis things might I build in? So my favorite example is convolution. So, so convolutional networks, it's, it's an awesome idea. It's a way of building in some significant prior knowledge about the spatial organization of the visual signal, right? It's built into brains and now we build it into our computer programs. That's an awesome thing to do. We should keep doing that. But I think we need to find a whole bunch more things like that, and that's a, a story we've heard a little bit today, a bunch of other mechanisms that we feel confident enough to build in that are pretty generic, don't make too many wrong commitments, and that we can build on both learning in the factory and learning in the wild. So the kinds of commitments that, that at least I feel like I need to make uh, are some kind of forward and backward inference, some kind of reification, some idea that objects are objects and that I can use them to organize my representation. Okay, hang on. I'm adapting to change in my environment. I'm not used to this kind of ear thing. Okay, I made it tidy. Maybe that'll work. Uh, temporal abstraction and so on. So I'll, I'll illustrate some of these things. And what I'm gonna do now is tell you for the first part of this talk about a system that I've built, a colleague of mine and I, two professors, have built almost entirely, no, entirely without any machine learning. And the reason we did that was to have an idea of what the pieces and parts it felt like we really needed in order to do an interesting job. And then I'll talk about how we're beginning to take things away and replace them with learning mechanisms. So the idea here is to like just do the dual, I think, of what many people are doing right now, which is to start with something that's mostly learning and figure out how to modulate it into something that solves bigger problems uh, with more structure. What we're doing is starting with something that's way too structured and way too hardwired and trying to figure out how to take some of that away. So it's a, a story that comes from a different direction. Okay, so I'll talk about this now. So let me come back to the kitchen, uh, the motivating problem, and tell you why it motivates me and what's particularly hard. So in robotics, people like to talk about how many degrees of freedom their robot has. Like, oh, mine has six or 10, right? That's how many joints it has. And problems are usually sort of grow exponentially difficult in difficulty as a function of the number of degrees of freedom. So now I ask, how many degrees of freedom does this kitchen have? Right, so six for each object's position, but then its size, its shape, its temperature, whether the grapes are rotten, how many you know, rolls are in the bag. The, 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 I can't even, it's not even sensible to talk about how many degrees of freedom that kitchen has, right? That's in fact, it's a stance I take when I go to model some part of it, how many degrees of freedom it has. So that's a kind of a tr difficult thing. What's the horizon? horizon? Well, endless, right? So imagine that you buy this robot, you pay a ton of money, it's supposed to help you out in the kitchen. It should work for a lot of years or even just make dinner. Uh, that's, you know, that's a lot of primitive motor action. So really long horizon dependency. Oh, and uncertainty. So the other thing that, that I spend a lot of time thinking about is being explicit about uncertainty. We'll have a talk later in this conference about consciousness and one, one of the ideas is that, well, for a system to be conscious or to at least feel like it's conscious when you interact with it, it has to have a model of its own understanding of what's going on about the world around it. 
And that's turned out to be very important for us in making robust robotic systems. So the robot has to be aware of the fact that it doesn't know many things about what's going on in its environment and take actions to get information. Okay, so we're gonna start with an architecture. Uh, I don't wanna argue about it. I don't really, I'm not deeply committed to it or anything, but it's just, it's what we have. It's got some boxes, usual sort of story. There's arrows that go forward, arrows that go backward. And I'm gonna talk about how we made that do a pretty complicated job. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is talk about belief space. So generally speaking, this is an old story from automata theory and control theory and everywhere. If you have a problem where you get observations about the state of the world, but they don't tell you everything, right? So, and I would argue that basically every problem is like this. You get observations, but they don't tell you everything, right? I don't know exactly, uh, I, you know, not only do I not know the exact position of objects, but I don't know what's in your head. I don't know what's going on outside. Mostly I don't know. I only know a few things, right? So to build a system where it gets observations about states of the world, but they don't tell it everything, you have to aggregate your observations over time into some kind of estimate or something of what's going on in the world around you. And then you can take that estimate of what's going on in the world around you and decide how to behave. So I'm gonna call that thing that flows between state estimation, which is the aggregation of my observations over time, and the module that decides what to do, a belief. That might, that offends some people calling it that. Consider instead if you can substitute probability distribution over possible states of the world, but it takes longer to say. So, belief. So belief is, what does the robot believe right now about the state of the world? And think of it as a distribution. So it's explicitly representing uncertainty. So in my robot, just to give you an idea of the kinds of beliefs for the system that we built, uh, the world is open, which means the robot doesn't know in advance what objects are gonna be in it. When it detects new objects, it reasons about whether they're an instance of an object it already knows about or a new object. It represents distributions over properties of the object, like its pose and its mass and so on. We make an explicit representation of what we do and don't know about the free space around us so that we don't, for instance, drive into a place we haven't looked before. Um, and we even do reasoning about what kinds of objects tend to co-occur so that if we wanna go look for something, we might uh, go, go find it somewhere else. So there's a lot of information in a belief state. It's a very complicated thing, representing what, what the robot knows about the world. Another thing that we have to do, so one thing that robotics people in general know how to deal with very well is geometry. There's a lot of work in reasoning about, about planning. If there are these particular obstacles in the world and I need to move from one pose to another, how can I plan a trajectory to do that? How can I do control along that trajectory? But if we have uncertainty about the positions of objects, we have to kind of convert that into a geometry problem. So imagine that the robot knows about a table, maybe it knows its shape roughly, and it has a probability distribution over where the table is. We make a shadows, which are, you can think of as kind of like confidence intervals over where the table might be. So those are regions of space such that if I don't go into them, I will with high probability not collide. So we think about how to convert reasoning about uncertainty into reasoning about geometry, because geometry we know how to do. So I'm gonna show you some pictures later on. So there's a shadow. I'm gonna show you some pictures later on that look sort of like this. It's not because we're terrible at graphics, but actually because I'm trying to give you some sense of how uncertain we are about the pose of objects. So this one on the left, the robot's very unsure about where the object is relative to it. So I've rendered the shadows. I mean, I'm not so good at graphics either, but, but the shadows are added on there too. So when you later on see some examples like this, you'll know what's going on. Okay, here's another thing that we do that's weird. So everything I do is kind of weird and really retro or something. Um, maybe so old it's new again. So logic, so logic used to be important in AI. It totally died out. Uh, and I think it died out because people tried to use it mostly for doing kind of rigid logical inference in zero one logic. But logic, the idea of logic is it's a formal language that lets you say things. And in my favorite thing about what logic can do for you is that it can give you short names for big sets. Okay. So if you want to remember something about logic, short names for big sets, right? So if I say, it's raining, that names all the possible worlds, including all the configurations of people in this room and everything where it's raining. So that's a name for a big set, short name, big set. So we use logical descriptions of sets of beliefs of the robot. And that's the language we plan in. 
OK, so that seems really weird, and I will try to illustrate it in various ways. Um, so for instance, I might say, I might have a logical kind of piece of expression in my robot's head that's something like, I believe with probability at least 0.9 that the object that's supporting object A is table one. Right, so that's a, a kind of a, a description, not just a description of the state of the world, that's a description of the state of the robot's belief about the world. It's a description of a set of possible beliefs of the robot about the world. And so there's a long story about this, so we can do it for continuous distributions, but basically we can do compact reasoning about whole sets of distributions. Okay, so given that language, a language for kind of internally representing what we know about the world and what, the ro what we do and don't know about the world, we can now think about the problem of planning. Right? So the, typically the problem of planning says, all right, I'm gonna take my belief about the state of the world Normal planning says I'm going to take the state of the world and a goal and derive a sequence of actions I can take to drive that state of the world into some goal configuration. That's the usual planning view. But we have this problem, which is that we don't know the state of the world. So we're going to do a couple of things that are unusual. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a plan, take the first step, execute it in the world, get an observation, update the belief, make a new plan, execute the first step, and so on. So one of the things I've learned from control theory, so in control theory, what do you do? You say, huh, I have a model of how the world works, I see what state I'm in, I derive an action to take, I take it, and then I immediately look to see what happened and pick another action. Now, if your model were right, you wouldn't have to keep looking. So the reason control theory has loops is because the model's never right, and the action you pick is never the perfect action, and you have to like fix it all the time. So somehow AI people were behind the door when that got passed out, that piece of insight, and so, the, but, but recently they, they've come out, and, but from behind the door they've realized that you can have a really horrible planning model and do okay in the world if you close the loop by getting observations and replanning. So that's one kind of, so we're gonna take that idea from low level control theory and import it into our highest levels of reasoning and, and acting in the world. Okay, the second thing is, what are we controlling? So typically in control theory or in AI planning, you say, oh, I have access to the state of the world, I'm gonna take actions that change the state of the world, and so I think about that as my plant, right? That's the name for all the world around me but me. In this system, the planner's view of the plant is actually not just the world, but the state estimator. So from the planner's perspective, it has to pick actions that will drive its own belief into a good state, right? So it's not enough for me to somehow cause a good state in the world. I have to cause a good state in the world and cause percepts to come into my head so that when I do a belief update based on those percepts, I will believe I caused the good state in the world. So that makes me actually verify. It makes me take actions and be sure that they came out right. Unless I'm so sure that my actions are reliable that I don't have to. So again, I wanna be sure that I have caused the changes in the world that I wanna cause. Okay. So how do we structure that planner? Um, we're gonna use a strategy called pre-image back, it's funny, uh, it's called regression in the planning literature, which is terrible because machine learning people think regression is something that's completely unrelated. So uh, AI planning people call it gold regre goal regression. Robotics people call it pre-image backchaining. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, goal-driven reasoning. So, okay, let's think about how this works. So I am gonna search, not in the space of state, because I don't know what state is, and I'm not gonna search in the space of belief states either, because for me, a belief state is this big, hairy, complicated thing you saw. It's got covariance matrices and big estimates of spatial uncertainty, and it's like this unwieldy thing. It would not be a good representation to use to reason about the state of the world. Instead, I'm gonna take the view that in any moment, and I'll talk about what, kind of what I mean by that, that I, my objective, my goal can be described reasonably compactly. Like, I would like to get out to the lobby, or I would like to give a good talk. Okay, so that's a pretty simple description compared to everything else in the world, how complicated the world is. So I'm gonna reason in the space 
of sets of beliefs. I want to arrive at, at one set of beliefs, and I'm going to figure out how I can take actions to drive my current belief into that set. So I start out with a goal, which is some set of belief states, right? Like, I believe I am in the next room. And I have my current belief, which is some of this whole complicated belief state that I showed you with matrices and, and so on. And I am going to now do a backward search from the goal. And I'm going to ask the question, if action one were to be the last action I ever took, what set of things would have to be true so that if I were to take A1, I would be in a satisfying state? So I'm just reasoning backwards. What would have to be true so that A1 would cause my goal to be true? And now I know if I can get into the blue blob, I'll be good because I could just take A1 and win. So, okay, now normal kind of AI, computer science search algorithms take over. I search backwards like this until I find the blob that contains my current belief. Because I know that if my current belief is that little yellow dot and I take A2, I'll end up somewhere in, this in that cloud over there. And then after that, if I take A1, I'll end up in the cloud that's the goal. So I can do this kind of high level, very abstract, backward reasoning. Okay. This is kind of expensive, and you don't want to do it over enormous state spaces, and in particular over long horizons. So to deal with the problem of long horizons, oh, okay, sorry, wrong segue. Mm, okay, I'll get to that in a minute, the problem of long horizons. Let me show you the models that we use to do that search. Using the language of of uh, kind of logical statements about the robot's belief, I can write down, and I can, I'll show you later, I can actually learn something that looks a little bit like this. I can write down rules that say something like this. So let's look at this rule. This says, if I would like the result to be that I believe that the location of some object O is at some target location with probability at least P, then it would be enough for me to believe that the object is in some previous location, starting location, with some other probability. And I can calculate that probability. So I can do reasoning that says, well, like if I'm pretty sure that the object is here and I try to move it from here to there, then after that, with high probability, I'll think it's over there. Lower probability than before because I might have dropped it along the way. So I'm going to make, in the end, pretty standard kind of symbolic planning rules but although they're symbolic planning rules, they're reasoning about belief distributions over continuous spaces. So I can reduce this to kind of a moderately standard planning problem. Uh, a big issue that we face is integrating reasoning about continuous spaces with reasoning about discrete spaces. That's a whole long technical story, which I'm not going to tell you about, but I have a couple students who kind of devote themselves to that, and it, it's complicated at some technical level. Okay, so now, so the thing about short horizons. So hierarchy is critical, and, and, and hierarchy is actually critical for us for a couple of different reasons. One reason why it's important to have hierarchical reasoning, sort of, is temporal hierarchical reasoning, is again because we're not, we, the, the, again, the, typically the difficulty of finding a plan is exponential in the length of the plan also. So the, you, if the plans are short, it's, your job is much easier. Many short plans is a much easier computational job than one really long one. But another reason is that we don't necessarily have the information we need to make a detailed plan far into the future, and that work is unlikely to pay off. So my favorite example, which got brought up yesterday by a different person, uh, but I'll use it again anyway, is uh, walking through the Newark airport, right? So I flew to Newark recently, and I, ma I made a plan to come here, and I planned to fly into Newark and then find my hotel. That was roughly the level of abstraction of my plan. And I was able to do that because I figured that once I got to Newark, I would like look around and follow the signs and find a way to get out of the airport, and then I'd find a way to find a car and so on and so forth. There would have been no point in me trying to plan my trajectory through the Newark airport while I was in Boston. But I just didn't have the information. So two good reasons for doing some kind of hierarchical planning and control. So what we do is we start out with some high-level goal, right? In my dreams, that high-level goal is something like make the people who bought you happy. 
subject to a bunch of constraints that keep you from killing other people and all that. Okay, so we're not gonna get into that, but imagine we have some high-level goal for the robot. Then we make a plan at a high level of abstraction. And when we make a plan using backward chaining, one of the reasons we use that sort of funky way of planning is that you get those clouds on the way back. Those clouds are the pre-images. Those clouds are a description, a sort of validity conditions for your plan. They say, if I were anywhere in this set of states, it would be cool, I could do that next action. So I get these, the, the O's here are meant to be operations, things that I could do at some abstract level, and the G's are the clouds, the different sub-goals. Right? I don't have to hit a state particularly, I just have to get into the next cloud. And so that is my high-level abstract plan. What I do then is I take that first objective and plan to reach it, retreat, to reach it in more detail. Uh, and at this point, like that green one might be a primitive, something I could execute, but it isn't yet. I plan again in more detail. Finally, I get a primitive and I execute it. So I execute optimistically and aggressively. I don't try to plan the rest of the plan. I just, I take that step. Then I'll get an observation, see what happened, update my belief, see if this plan is still valid, and if it is, I'll continue executing it, and if not, I will pop it off the stack and replan, right? So if I find that my plane can't land in Newark and instead we're in Philadelphia, well, I will pop off some parts of my stack, right? But I, I won't, like, give up coming here. Oh, I might, but probably not. And I won't give up, like, my career path, probably, and so on. And what, what's interesting is that this lets you, by the way that you manage this process lets you address a bunch of really interesting issues from cognition and, 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 and philosophy having to do with reconsideration, right? How frequently you, do you reconsider your commitments at different levels of abstraction, right? If you do it too often, then you're crippled, right? Maybe you know people who keep thinking about whether they should be doing the thing that they're doing. If you don't do it often enough, you might not take advantage of opportunities that present themselves to you. So it's a, it's a really interesting structure to have around. You can do interesting reasoning with it. Okay, so now what I wanna do is uh, use a concrete, okay, uh, show you a concrete example of a robot doing something using these strategies. Uh, and it's, so um, just to give you a hint of how it works. So this robot is trying, to, wants to move the blue, we told it to move the blue box over to the side of the table. We also told it that it can't reach over just to make the demo simple and easy. And unbeknownst to the robot, there is a dastardly soup can in the way of the box. The box is called soda because it's a box of baking soda, and it's blue because I had to put blue tape around it because otherwise it leaks baking soda all over the table. Okay, so the robot makes a high-level plan. High-level plan is a hierarchical plan. What's interesting about it is that its top-level steps are place the soda box down and then look to be sure that it's there. All right, so that's trust but verify. So the robot reasons about where it can go so that it can, so it plans to look at the box so that it can see where it is before it picks it up, goes over there, takes a look. I'm gonna do this really quickly. It sees that the soup can is out of the way. It kind of replans, makes a complicated plan that involves moving over, picking up the soup, moving it out of the way. It goes over there, it says, all right. Uh, it, it, it gets ready to pick up the soup can. And then it says, oh man, I don't have a good enough view of the soup can and now my arm is in the way. This is really annoying. So it moves its hand out of the way to see. Now, if we were planning optimally and flat and not hierarchically, we would have never gone up there in the first place with the hand in the way. So hierarchy gives us computational efficiency, but it removes from us some chances to be super optimal. I don't worry about that too much because if I do some, not introspection, but just watching myself do stuff in the world, I do occasionally do dumb things. I don't know about you. Um, so, okay, so the robot can do these things, and eventually it will come over here and pick up the soup can, and you probably don't really want to watch this. This is like watching baby movies or something. So ro robots are really not very good. Really don't worry about robots for quite a while. Um, uh, but, you know, it goes over there, and it picks up the soup can, and moves it out of the way, and so on. Okay, we're not going to do this in detail. And now it finally gets the soda box, and it does the thing with the arm again. And it moves it over here, and it does it. Okay, so here's a little example of the same code. Okay, so here's the thing. If you watch robot demos on YouTube, they are awesome, and they look way better than this. Partly better production values, but partly they're robots that are tuned up to do a particular thing. So my robot is like a jack of all trades, definitely not a master of anything. But like here, 
it, it was trying to get the green box to the end of the table. Uh, it couldn't pick it up because it's too big. It knows how to push things. Its model for pushing was not so good, so it pushed it and then realized it didn't go all the way, so it pushed it some more and so on. But what's important is that this is the same code as the thing that picked stuff up. And it's going to be the same code again that moves these chairs out of the way. So it's doing things in pretty general way, reasoning about objects in space and, and so on. So that's an important point, I think. OK, we do not have time to watch this. I'll tell you something about learning and then quit, because as far as I can tell, I have like just a couple minutes. OK, so more recently, and especially all students come in now, they only want to do learning, right? So that's the only thing students want to do. So that's cool. So they're doing some kinds of learning, and so are we. Um, and there's a bunch of different things you can learn. You can learn transition models, observation models, primitive policies, object detectors. You can also do reasoning, sort of metacognitive learning. You can learn how to reason more efficiently. That's what AlphaGo is, right? AlphaGo doesn't need to learn a model of its dynamics. It needs to learn how to reason more efficiently. So these two kinds of reasoning are both really important. And this, an architecture like this affords a bunch of different kinds of reasoning. Um, and a bunch of different kinds of learning. And one of the things I like to talk about, right, is letting our hypotheses die in our stead. So if I learn a policy and it doesn't work very well, well, uh, the robot might have a problem. If I learn, you learn a model, usually it's more robust and I can think about what might go bad and look ahead a little bit and I can think about falling off a cliff but possibly not do it. Um, just to give you an idea of some kinds of learning that aren't neural networks, we did some work actually a fairly long time ago learning from a simulation of a bad physics world to make predictions about what happens when the robot tries to pick objects up and stack them. And it's able to learn things like, rules like, picking up middle-sized objects does, usually works. You can't pick up really big things. If a little block is on something, then something else happens. And I can use these rules to plan. More recently, we've been learning uh, the effects of motor actions. So this is a case where we've learned what happens when the robot tries to push something, when it tries to scoop, when it tries to pour. And we can take those learned models and a totally competent planner that already knows how to pick things up and put them down and make plans to combine the little bits and pieces that we've learned in completely new ways, in completely new scenarios. Uh, so now we've gone from hand building to learning, and I'll say thank you very much and ask for questions. Okay. Thank you, Leslie. For those of you in the back, come in. There's more seats scattered around, and we have time for some questions. There's one yeah, there. sure. I have a question from a neuroscience perspective. So often I hear it said from an engineering perspective that you really understand the phenomenon when you actually can rebuild it and simulate it in full and create a thing that, that does this thing. And so here you've, you're creating a system that has action selection and state estimation and so on, all these blocks. And I, my question was to draw an analogy to neuroscience where is it reasonable to suspect that these are the right conceptual <coughs> blocks by which any intelligent system would have to carry out these things? So for instance, as a neuroscientist, I hear action selection and I look at those feedback loops and I think of the phenomenon of efferent copy. I look at state estimation and I start thinking about brain regions that might do that, uh, cerebellum, which is a region that I study. Uh, if I think about hierarchical control, I start thinking about structures that we as neuroscientists may think of as being important for that. So to what extent do you think these, these are the right blocks and should we start looking for learning mechanisms and so on that correspond to things that you're implementing in robotic? Okay, so, so that's a great question and I don't really know the answer. So the fact is that my constraints are really different than the constraints of a natural system in terms of the hardware that I use to build it, both the, the brain and the, and the physical parts and the sensors. Um, so I think at some very high level, at some kind of information theoretic level, there are lessons from engineering that would apply to neuroscience. There are things, math about sample complexity and machine learning that I think is inescapable and applies to any system we build. And there's there's, uh, there are kind of fundamental theorems of information processing that, that apply. My particular modular decomposition, I would not begin to imagine uh, has force for natural systems. It's, it's, it's been convenient for me. 
another thing is, I think, that I, as an engineer, have, I kind of have a small brain, and I can only think of things in small pieces at a time. I think I need more modularity than nature did in making brains, so that my systems might end up being more modular, not because they have to be, but because I need to build them that way. So, so the answer is I don't, I don't really know. I, I'm hoping you can inspire me and I can inspire you, but I would not presume to say that decisions I make ha uh, will have force in, for natural systems. Someone else? Well, I'll ask one, mm -hmm. a little bit off the wall question. So in just thinking about maybe how to bridge from the kinds of retro AI tools that you're using, which I love, um, to both the sort of the, the uh, blitz of deep learning and, uh, and, and the path to connecting that, that mm -hmm. brains, there is this a uh, little sub area of neurosymbolic processing, which is about taking a, a kind of symbolic reasoning approach like what you're using um, and implementing that with neural nets. And there's also um, a, a pretty large uh, sub area of neuroscience, which is gonna be represented by our next talk along with a bunch of stuff that you know a bunch of us have done in, in vision about doing probabilistic reasoning, you know, uh, a Bayesian estimation in vision, uh, you know, uh, 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 Bayesian models of, of motor control is basically the general topic of the next talk. I don't know exactly what you're going to talk about, but I presume that relate to that. Um, so there are kind of two pieces of technology that you're using here mm -hmm. um, that, 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 could, that, that could plug in. It's true, <laughs> although, so I, my intuition tells me that the trying to differentiate Turing machines and theorem provers might not be the right way to learn structures like that. So there are plenty of learning algorithms that aren't fast prop. And uh, we can search in the space of rules. Uh, we can do it at, so if you're searching for symbolic structures, for instance, it might be better to just search in the space of symbolic structures directly using different, different strategies. So I, I mean, I, I love deep networks. I like to use them when they're good for the problem that I have, but I also often have problems. I mean, another thing that I would show you is this thing where we learned, we learned to, to so we had a procedure that could pour and it had parameters, but now we need to learn a model of it that we can combine with other things in order to do a job. And so I need to learn Conditioned on the parameters I give the motor controller, the basically gains, so conditioned on these gains, some properties of the vessel I'm pouring to and from, uh, what the viscosity of the stuff is, and so on, will this operation be successful or not? But I would like to learn that also not with 100,000 examples. Uh, and so we use, like, say, Gaussian processes to do this so that I can try experiments explicitly in the parts of the space I don't understand very well and learn from 30 or 50 examples instead of 100,000. So I think we should embrace all the techniques and not just like just the one. I'm totally with you. I'm just going to push you on one more yeah. question related to that. How do you, when you do use a deep net, yeah. how do you integrate it in with the rest of this machinery? Because that, that, that's why I was asking about neurosymbolic, right. right? Because there needs to be some kind of interface right. between the sort of the representation and processing of a deep net type, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, box, right. uh, and, and all of the other tools right. that you're using. So, I mean, again, this is maybe I have limited imagination, but this is what we're up to. So perception, object detection. So deep nets are awesome for that, finding things in the image. Uh, okay, images don't let me grab things. So what do I do? I use a deep net to initialize a 3D fitter of a model to the thing. I could use deep nets to learn primitive policies. That's a perfect thing for deep reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning, I think, is good for learning to ride bicycles, but probably not to come to Newark. Uh, I, so I can, I can use different learning techniques in different places all over here. Now, you might ask, how, do I, how would I supervise those things? And that's still a kind of a design problem that I have. And, and how do you translate from the language of the output of one, which is in one kind of representation, to provide a useful input to another, which is a completely, conceptually completely different right. kind of representation? So you do need to find supervision signals that will let you do that, right? Yeah. That's it, yeah. So I don't know this whole story. That's just where I'm going. All right.
Oh, there's a question right here. Can we get a mic down front? We have time. You can just stand up and be loud. What happened to our microphone? Here we go. Here's a microphone. Okay. This person. Quick question. Uh, <coughs> how much of these processes are online and how much of them happen offline? Especially for hierarchical decomposition and abstraction, you could imagine that some things that currently during this task, my attention doesn't need to go further up in the abstraction levels, but perhaps later on I need it. Or maybe right now I need to abstract to some extent, but it's not useful later on. Both ways, how much of it is online, how much offline? Right, at the moment, so one of the things I said we could learn is what abstraction level to use at the moment. Right now we're not learning that. I think I know how to set up that learning problem, but we're not doing it right now. Similarly, I think for state estimation, right? Um, the way robotics people like to do state estimation is by filtering, which I, I, which I think of as an eager strategy, where I take all my current observational information and I fold it into my belief very aggressively, no matter whether it's relevant to what I'm trying to do right now or not. Another thing that I think I know how to do but haven't yet done is to learn which objects and properties are important to the goal I'm doing right now based on the stack a, a, and attend to those. And so only be eager about the computational updating processes relative to the things that are relevant to what I'm doing right now. That risks, however, not noticing bad stuff is happening. So th I mean, there's a bunch of questions, but yeah. Thank you again. <laughs>